Well, in order to uh, help illustrate what we're going to talk about today, I need uh, a couple volunteers. And uh, I know immediately once I say that, everybody's head goes down, don't look at me. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to make it a little bit of a competition between a husband and wife. So I, I need to pick a couple whose marriage I think is pretty well intact or is so in shambles it's not going to matter anyway. All right? Uh, and I won't tell you where they are, but I'm going to pick this lucky couple right here sitting in the front row. Come on up. All right? All right. So I'm going to have you over here. I'm going to have you over here. And what you're going to do uh, to help illustrate uh, part of what I'm talking about today is you're going to take this lump of clay and you're going to make a man. You're going to take this lump of clay and you're going to make a woman. All right? And then we'll kind of judge to see who the best artiste is when we're all done. She doesn't know anything? Okay. You can decide where, where their marriage is at uh, just with that comment right there. So while they're doing that, I want to take you back to the second chapter of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, where the writer provides for us this moving, compelling, profound picture of the Creator at work. And the picture that he uses for us is that of God, whatever God looks like, on his knees, bent over the ground, pulling all of the earth together and beginning to shape it into a human being, shaping it into a man in this case. Uh, to help you visualize that, you might think of little kids or even adults on the beach. And they're pulling all the sand together and they're pouring water on it. And they're forming it and shaping it into castles or into animals or other things. That's the picture of God in Genesis chapter 2. God is on his knees and he is pulling together all of the dust around him and all of the mud and the dirt. And he's shaping it into a man. He's shaping it into his image. And once he has this man outlined through mud and clay... He leans over once again and he breathes life into the man and the man becomes a living being. It is a profound, powerful picture of God the creator at work creating his ultimate masterpiece. Thousands of years later, the psalmist picked up on that theme and he talked about creation, used a different kind of metaphor, but here's what he says. For it was you who formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. For my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And so you have this one picture of God forming a human being out of the dust of the earth and shaping it. And then you have another picture of God busy at work welding together, which is what the word knit means, welding and knitting together us in our mother's womb. And then Paul a few thousand years later, picks up the theme once again. And he says that not only did God create us, but he created us for a purpose. And he says, for you are God's craftsmanship. You are his work of art, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so you were... You better hurry up, because I'm, I'm just about done. Okay. We're here as long as he's here. Yeah. So here's the point. You're created for a purpose. You were formed, you were shaped, you were knitted together in your mother's womb for a purpose. And that purpose is for good works. You were created to be a superhero. To use the personality, the gifts that God has created in you to make the world a better place. And so when God created us, he poured his heart and soul into us. He breathed into us the breath of life. He breathed into us our personalities. He breathed into us our gifts and abilities. He breathed into us a particular passion for life. And those are all clues. Those little puffs of breath are all clues as to what our purpose is. When you understand your personality, when you know what your gifts are, when you know what your passion is, you know why God created you. And you'll know what your purpose is in life. So last weekend, Kimberly began our series, and we're calling this series Discover Your Purpose, Unlocking Your Inner Superhero. And over the next several weeks, we're going to look at these various things that God has created in you and in me that tells us what our purpose is so that we can be a part of changing the world. And today we're going to turn our attention to our God-given personalities. And so uh, I think we'll start over here. Just 
Okay. Uh, are you ready to hold yours up? Yeah. It looks like Mr. Bill, only a girl. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. All right. Okay. This is really quite a work of art. What do you do for a living, by the way, just so everyone knows? I'm a nurse. She's a nurse. All right. All right. Can you see that? Oh, put it down. Put your hand down a little bit. Uh, a little hard to see, but it's, it's actually pretty good. So let's see. We'll see if we can sit her up right there. Um, just to kind of watch. Yeah. All right. So. Okay, I guess it's the man's head. Um, okay. This is a nose, a smile, the, the eyes, and the, pro, the Cro-Magnon head there. He's got, he's got the evolutionary theory along with creation right there. Um, he teaches science. All right, so. Well, not anymore. Now I'm demoted. Oh, now you're, yeah, he doesn't teach it anymore. Well, we know why he's not an art teacher. All right, let's give him a round of applause. There are a lot of different things that go into making us who we are. And a lot of those things come to us from the outside, what we would call nurture. Uh, so some of those things would include our birth order. Uh, you can't really choose your birth order, but your birth order shapes you. If you know anything about birth order, uh, you know that firstborns tend to have certain qualities and middleborns share certain qualities and so on. Um, your parents' values help shape you from the outside. The country you're born in can shape you from the outside. So there are a lot of different things that make us who we are. But one of the things that comes to us from birth is our personality. We're all born with the basic personality that we will have for the rest of our lives. God created that in us. And as we better begin to understand our personality type or our personality leanings, how it is that we relate to the world, how it is that we express ourselves, as we better understand our personality traits, we better understand our purpose in life. So what I want to do today is to introduce you to the four basic personality types. And we're going to fly through this stuff today. Uh, and my, my hope is that it will interest you enough that you'll want to go and learn a little bit more about yourself. Maybe you'll learn a little bit more about the person you're married to or that you're raising. And um, also that um, you, you might just have a, a sense today a little bit more of who you are and what your purpose is in life. And to help us better understand these personality types, I'm going to tie each of them to a superhero. And the superhero will sort of represent each of these different personality types. So we're going to run through these quickly. Four basic personality types. Most of us here are made up of two of these four. All right? Um, and uh, so what we'll talk a little bit about that, strengths and weaknesses. And hopefully you'll get to know a little bit about yourselves and the people that you love. So we're going to start with probably the strongest of the personalities, and that's the choleric. The choleric... Um, as is true of everybody, has certain strengths and then certain weaknesses. So here are some of the strengths of the choleric. The choleric is the born leader. This is the person who basically comes out of the womb and has a wonderful plan for your life and runs the world. I have a granddaughter like that. Uh, we often joke that she runs the church, and there's a lot of truth to that. She's four years old, but she runs the church. She is a born leader. Um, cholerics are very decisive. They can make a decision in a moment's notice. They have no problem making decisions. They always sort of have a sense of where they're going. They're very strong leaders in that sense because they're decisive. They're also very self-sufficient. Uh, because a choleric has such a strong personality as a leader, is decisive kind of person, cholerics don't really need other people. But because God made so many of them, we have to sort of tolerate them, all right? We'll put up with them. But we don't really, and notice I say we because it's my personality type, we're self-sufficient. We can do it ourselves. It's that kind of strong personality. And that can be both a strength and, of course, it can be a weakness because your greatest strengths can be your greatest weaknesses. Cholerics tend to be very confident uh, because they have this, this sense of they know where they're going. And, and very rarely do you see conf or cholerics ever waver in their belief. They know where they're going, they know where they're headed, they feel good about it, and they go for it. They're goal-oriented. They see the big picture. 
They have a way of seeing things that other people maybe can't see. And because they can see the big picture, they have the confidence to move forward. And a lot of times people who don't have this personality wonder, well, how, how are you seeing that? How are you getting there? Don't you see all the impossibilities? The cholerics don't see that because they see the whole picture. And they love to step into what's impossible. And so when you take that proverbial glass, is it half full or is it half empty? For a choleric, it doesn't matter. They'll just tell you, fill the glass. And if you don't have that personality, you'll probably jump and fill the glass. All right? They're people who need to be dealt with. So when you think about the choleric, uh, a superhero to think about would be Thor. All right? Thor's got this big hammer, and he never questions anything. He just goes in, and he gets the job done. There are other superheroes who go through this uh, sort of existential, uh, existential questioning of themselves. Am I doing this right? Should I do this? But not Thor. He sees the big picture. He goes in and he does it. And Wonder Woman is the same way. She knows where she's going. She knows where she's headed. And when she goes, people want to follow her. Those are strengths of a choleric. Because the choleric has such strong strengths, the choleric also has strong weaknesses. Um, so some say, and I've never experienced this myself, but some say cholerics can be bossy. I, 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 this is what I've read in books. Uh, I don't have many of these weaknesses, which ought to tell you what my personality type is. All right, they can tend to be bossy, and they can be bossy because they, they're so confident in where they're going. They can be impatient with people who aren't as confident to go that way. Uh, Cholerics can see it. We can taste it. We, we know how to get there. And when people aren't ready to go, we just get impatient with, what's the problem? Let's go. Time's a-wasting. Uh, Quick-tempered. Uh, you, uh, you can get so frustrated waiting for people and trying to get people caught up that if you're not careful, you can become easily angered and you have a quick temper. Uh, my wife will attest to that occasionally. Um, be inflexible. Now, here's why cholerics are inflexible. Because they see the whole picture, because they're goal-oriented, because they know where they're going, they always assume that they're right. And for those of you who aren't cholerics, here's the bad news and the good news. They are almost always right. Now, a good choleric will learn how to bring people with him or her and give them time to get caught up. The choleric who's working in his or her weaknesses is just going to go and hope people will catch up. And a lot of times you just get too far ahead. So they can become inflexible because they have this intuitive sense that they're right and most of the time they are. And then they're not willing to listen to other things and a good choleric will step back and say, look, I think this is right, but I better get some, some other uh, validation for that. The sheer force of their personality can be overwhelming, particularly for the next personality type I'm going to talk about in a moment. Because cholerics are so uh, sure of themselves and have such confidence, if they're not careful, they can really intimidate people who don't have that strong personality. And here's another thing I've heard. I, I've not seen this in my own life. They can be sarcastic. And... Um, the thing with a choleric sarcasm, which will be different from the one I'll talk about in a moment, a, chol a choleric sarcasm really hurts because there's nothing subtle about it at all. All right? It can be really funny. I think it's hilarious. It can be really funny. <laughs> but if you're on the receiving end and you don't have a good relationship, it can really bite and really sting. It's like just getting smashed with the, the fist right in the face. So for you cholerics, your strengths are your strengths, and we're going to talk a little bit more at the end about you know, your purpose in life, but you need to be very, very aware of your weaknesses and let God mold and shape them and use them positively. The second person, by the way, how many of you are married to cholerics? At least you, you've finally decided you're married to a choleric. All right. How many would you like to get out of that? <laughs> so the second personality type is the direct opposite. It's called the phlegmatic. You cannot be a choleric and a phlegmatic. Well, they have medications if you do. But you, can, you, can't, be, <laughs> you can't be both. These are directly the opposite. All right? The, or the phlegmatic's personality it tends to be very, very easygoing. 
These are the people who are always, always seem to be calm and cool. It's okay. Don't sweat it. Hakuna Matata. Okay, Sarah, Sarah. These are the kind of people you like to be around when you're really stressed out. They just, everything's okay. They don't go way up. They don't go way down. They're just kind of right here in a zone. It's a phlegmatic. Um, they have a, now, I don't want you to think that because we're comparing them to cholerics that these are not strong people. They have a deep, quiet strength about them. Many of our great leaders throughout history have been phlegmatics because they have this, this iron, steely strength, but it's really calm and quiet. Where the choleric is very loud about leadership, the phlegmatic can be very quiet about it, but you want to follow because you know there's something there. They're steady. They're loyal. They're good friends. Here's a strength and a weakness. They tend to take the path of least resistance. Cholerics want as much resistance as possible because they just want to blow the doors down. Phlegmatics are looking for just the opposite. They want the path of least resistance. Don't rock the boat. They can be very, very witty. Uh, my father-in-law, who ran this multi-million dollar company, was a phlegmatic. Uh, a lot of times people would walk into the room wanting to meet the boss, had no idea he was the boss. But when he spoke, people listened. And he had a very, very witty sense of humor, as does my son, who's a phlegmatic. Uh, when it comes to that glass of water, whether it's half full or half empty, phlegmatic says, it doesn't matter, there's water in the glass. It's okay. Don't sweat it. So their superhero would be Spider-Man. Now, we know that Spider-Man's a fighter, but when you think about Peter Parker and you think about Spider-Man, uh, you think about a guy who just before he got bit by that spider, nobody really knew who he was. He was just kind of there, kind of even keel. And, uh, you know, his friends sort of looked to him to be even keel. And even as the superhero, he, he just was sort of level-headed and always took it really cool until he was pushed. Uh, Supergirl, same way. Strong, gets stuff done, but she does it in a very quiet way. Doesn't really get, the boat doesn't get rocked until she's pushed to the limit, and that's when she'll move. Now, phlegmatics also have weaknesses. They can be indecisive. Um, because one of the things that phlegmatics live for is to avoid conflict. One of the things cholerics live for is to stir up conflict. Phlegmatics want nothing to do with it. And so if you have to make a decision, you could cause conflict. And so you'd rather not make a decision. So I tell this story all the time. I have my wife's permission to do so. Um, when we were young, younger, um, we would go grocery shopping together, and literally, she could spend 15 minutes in the bathroom, tissue, and the Kleenex aisle trying to figure out which to get, and she would just be paralyzed with all the choices. Couldn't make a decision. My wife does not like to make decisions, except in her areas of strength. The reason why we make a good team is because I love making decisions. She's very cautious about them, and we balance each other out. But they don't like to make decisions. They avoid responsibility. Why? Because if you take responsibility, it could lead to conflict. Because responsibility means you've got to do something, and it might upset somebody else. They can lack motivation at times because they're just so easygoing, and everything's okay. Uh, oftentimes you'll find that these are people who want to just sit back and observe life rather than get involved. They resist change because change brings conflict. And they don't want conflict. And so sometimes change can be very, very difficult for them. They can become overly stubborn. Now, this is, this is both a strength and a weakness for a, a phlegmatic. Once they've been pushed to the limit, they'll dig their heels in and you can't move them. And when they need to make a stand, that's a good thing. But when they make, need to make a decision and they dig their heels in and say, I'm not doing it, that can be a problem. So they can be extremely stubborn when they feel like they're pushed to the limit. And that usually happens in the face of conflict, where they'll, they'll either dig their heels in or they'll just shut down. They'll be almost paralyzed. They, too, can be sarcastic. But their sarcasm is a little different. It's more subtle. So they can make a sarcastic remark, and you won't notice it until about two or three seconds later, and then, wait a minute, I, I think he just ripped my face off. 
So that's the personality of the phlegmatic, all right? So you've got the choleric, you've got the phlegmatic. You are either a choleric or a phlegmatic. You can't be both, okay? There are two other personality types. These are also both opposites. The first of those is the melancholy. This is also my personality trait. Melancholies are very thoughtful people. They're deep thinkers. They're very analytical. They're constantly evaluating things. So for my wife, Jan, who loves to do drawing and loves to do sewing and loves working with art stuff, she's constantly analyzing how to do better. Right now she's drawing portraits of our grandchildren, and she's just painstaking in all the details just to get it right and learning as much as she can. Uh, as a melancholy, one of the things that I do is I, I analyze, of course, what's happening in the church and what's going on. But one of the hardest things for me to do is to go to another church. Because as soon as I walk on the campus, I'm analyzing everything. Ah, oh, boy, how did they do that? Why did they do that? Well, that worked. That didn't work. Well, we could do that. Well, we'd never do that. I'm constantly analyzing the sermons. Forget it. It's hard for me to listen to sermons because I'm constantly analyzing. What are they saying? Melancholies are perfectionists. This will be a strength and it will be a weakness. It's a strength because when they do something, it's going to be done right. And they'll make sure they do the hard work to get it done right. These are the detailed people. People who like things to be in order. They're the people who uh, would be great to organize your food pantry. And they'll organize it by you know, alphabet or by food group. Uh, their closets are very organized, either by color or designer label or whatever it might be. Uh, these are the people who tend to uh, organize everything and bring order to chaos. They love making lists. Anybody have list makers that you love and care for, all right? They love lists. One of the best gifts, husbands, Valentine's Day is just six months away, buy her a book that says lists how to make lists, buy her notebooks at lists. Every night before they go to bed, their to-do list says, make a list tomorrow. They live for that. They dream about lists. Nothing brings them more pleasure than their lists and checking off those little things, okay? Um, they feel things deeply. This will be a weakness, but it's also a great strength. They feel things deeply. So when you need someone to understand what you're going through, you want to talk to a melancholy. Because they're going to feel what you feel. And they're going to take on what you feel. Now because they're perfectionists, because they always want everything done right, the glass is always going to be half empty. And this is where their weaknesses come in. For perfectionists, and again this is me now, so I understand these weaknesses as well. Uh, for melancholies, our great strength is being a perfectionist and our great weakness is being a perfectionist. And the reason why it's a weakness is because we know deep down inside it can never be perfect. And because it's not perfect, it strikes a blow to our self-esteem. Because we need to be perfect. And it can create all kinds of problems when it comes to faith. Because we feel like, as melancholies, the only way God can accept me is if I give him my absolute perfect best. And I can never quite do that. And so we have a hard time accepting a God who loves imperfect people. Cholerics have a hard time with faith at times because they believe they can save themselves. For the melancholy, it's i got to be perfect before God can love me. The weakness side of it. They can be overly critical because everything needs to be perfect. And they're always analyzing everything. So they tend to see what's not working, what's wrong, which makes them overly critical. It can be a strength, but it also becomes a weakness. Because they feel deeply, if they're not careful, they can become easily depressed. Because they take on the emotions of other people, uh, they have a hard time letting it go. So for a guy like me, who's a melancholy, my, my main personality is the choleric, my secondary is the melancholy, so I can get in, in the welcome folder, let's say, there are 50 notes of, man, that was the best worship service ever, and get one that said, you just really stunk up the joint today. And I will obsess over that one comment for two weeks. That's what melancholies do. Okay? So don't write those notes anymore. <laughs> That's the choleric defending his melancholy. They can become too introspective. All right, again, 
They, they, in, they internalize everything, and if they're not careful, if they're not careful, they begin to really internalize, and they start getting depressed. Um, think about, for a moment, Batman, who's a choleric, but he's also a melancholy. He broods over everything. All right? everything why do they call him the Dark Knight? Because he's so deeply melancholy. Uh, a couple of uh, people who fit this characterization would be Captain America. Captain America, he's always got to do it right. He's always got to do it perfectly. Um, if you saw the movie The Avengers, you know that he and Iron Man were constantly fighting with each other. Because Iron Man had the exact opposite personality, which we'll talk about in a moment. For, for uh, Captain America, he wants everything in order. He wants to follow the rules. It's got to be done perfectly. For uh, Iron Man, whatever. Well, let's just get it done. And he's just bouncing off the walls. So Captain America has this personality. Wonder Woman has this personality. Batman has this personality type. Uh, I mentioned that they can struggle with low self-esteem and they can also be worriers. Constantly worrying. The great classic biblical story is the story of Martha and Mary. Martha's got the melancholy personality. She wants everything to be perfect. She wants the meal to be just right. She wants all of her guests to feel welcome. Nothing wrong with that. And at one point she says, Jesus, couldn't you send my sister in who's out there, who's got the opposite personality of her sister. She's out enjoying the fun. She says, come on, send Mary in here to help me out. And Jesus says, Martha, you worry too much. Now he's not taking her aside because she's melancholy and because she's doing all the hard work. She is working out of her weakness. She's worrying too much and melancholies can do that. The final personality, just the exact opposite of the melancholy is the sanguine. The sanguines are the ones that you know almost immediately because when they walk in the room, they, take, they are the life of the party. Everybody wants to be with the sanguine because they have so much joy. They have this bubbling personality. You Almost always you can tell it in their eyes. Their eyes are just dancing all the time. They're extremely talkative. They're talking all the time. And all the time. Rah, 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 rah. And most of the time, I'm not sanguine, uh, most of the time... They're going to be talking about themselves, which we'll talk about being their weakness. So they're very expressive verbally, and they're also very expressive because they're always touching things. They're the people who have to touch you when they talk. Okay? So you melancholies, are, oh, you, I can't stand those kinds of people. But sanguines, oh, man, we just love to touch each other and rumple the hair. Or, wow, that dress is pretty. They're always very, very expressive. They have this love for people. They are energized when they're with people. The melancholy... Energized with a book, alone in a corner. Sanguine, energized with a lot of people around. The more people, the better, because it's all about the party. The wonderful thing about tiggers, our tiggers are wonderful things. Okay? So when they see the glass, it's always half full. Even if it's empty, it's half full. Because they have this wonderful optimism about life. So Iron Man would be a sanguine. Tony Starks, who's the, uh, the guy who's always drawing attention to himself, always flying by the seat of his pants. He doesn't think anything through. He just goes for it. And, and he is the life of the party. Batgirl, life of the party. She gets stuff done. But she's got this bubbly personality. She, wants to, she just wants to light up the room when she walks in. So sanguines have these wonderful personalities. People love to be around them. But they also have their weaknesses. They have a high need to be liked. And so that can make them very superficial. Okay? They have a high me factor. So, as I mentioned, when they, when they walk into a room, they'll start talking. But if you listen carefully you'll find that they're almost always talking about themselves, telling stories about themselves. And it's okay, because they're so engaging, and it's so interesting. Uh, I worked with a sanguine, Walt Callistead's sanguine personality, and he was uh, my senior pastor, and I was the associate for 20-some years. Anytime that guy was on a plane, he'd come back with a great story. I, keep, I never have stories when I'm on an airplane. No, I sit... Of course, I sit with my book and don't touch me, don't look at me. <laughs> so that could be part of it. But Walt always had stories. 
always had stories. And the amazing thing was when he and I would travel together, we'd be in the exact same place at the same time. He had a story to tell and I didn't. And I had no idea where that story came from because I was there the whole time. Because they have this high need to be liked, and because they, they need a lot of people around them, they can tend to have a lot of friends and not know anybody. Okay? A lot of friends, but not really know anybody. Because part of the weakness of a saying was they don't want to go deep. Everything needs to be happy. Everything needs to be bubbly. And if you go deep... You start dealing with real stuff. And sanguines in their weakness don't like to do that. Uh, I, ted, I said that they can be overly talkative. Um, they exaggerate the truth. Now, this, I wrote this, so I'm a melancholy. Melancholies want things to be accurate. Sanguines just want a great story. So there may be a kernel of truth. They were there. But the rest of it is an embellishment. Now, they're not intentionally lying like a melancholy would think. They're just telling a story. My dad was a sanguine. And my dad would weave stories, and he, would, he was always had people going, all the time. Uh, one time I had a friend walk up to me. I was in uh, you know, junior high or something. And a friend walked up. He's looking at my, my forehead. I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm just looking at your forehead. I said, why? I'm trying to see the scar. What scar? He said, well, your dad told me that you were born with an ear on your forehead. <laughs> That's what sanguines do. Any of you remember the movie The Big Fish? All right, it's a story about a dad who just told these big whoppers of stories. You love being with sanguines who do that. Unless you're the butt of the joke. But they're just great, they're just great storytellers. All right, but that can also be their weakness. Um, they also tend to be controlled by circumstances because they live in the moment. If it ain't happy, if it isn't bouncy, um, they can just they just sort of shut down. Because the one thing sanguines don't do well is depression, or hurt, or any kind of pain at all. Okay, that can be a weakness. And one of the things that sanguines have to learn is that life consists of both. So, you can either be choleric or phlegmatic, and you can either be melancholy or sanguine. So, again, I'm a choleric melancholy. My wife is a phlegmatic melancholy. You can be a phlegmatic sanguine. You can be a choleric sanguine. All right, that's a lot of stuff to take in, so go to the internet, find out all about yourself. But hopefully what, you've, what I've given you today is just a little brief overview into who God created you to be. You were born that way. And as you discover your personality type, you begin to discover your purpose in life. Why God created you. So a part of your purpose in life is simply to be who God created you to be. If you're a choleric, then be a choleric. If you're a sanguine, then be a sanguine. Don't try to be your mother's personality or your dad's personality or that person who you admire, their personality, be who you were created to be. Part of your purpose in life is to say to God, God, you've given me this personality and now I give it back to you. Use it for your honor and glory. And ask that God would brighten your strengths, brighten them up, and sand down your weaknesses so that you really can be who you were created to be. And then... Your purpose in life is to live out your personality. So if you're a choleric, your purpose in life, in part, is to bring clear, decisive direction to this world and to lead people into the impossible, whatever that might look like for you. If you're a phlegmatic, a part of your purpose in life is to bring some calm and stability in a world that has so much anxiety. If you're a melancholy, a part of your purpose in life is to bring order to life. When life can be so chaotic and, and out of control. And if you're a sanguine, part of your job description is to bring joy to the world. What a great job description. But notice, we need all of them. If you just have joy and bouncing off the walls, you're not going to get anything done. And if you're always just 
Bursting through walls, you never have a chance just to slow down and listen to God. We need all four personality types. And God has created you with your personality types. And the better you know yourself, the better able you'll be to discover your purpose in life. Now, there's some other things that will help you discover your purpose in life. Your God-given gifts and abilities. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. We're going to talk about the particular passion. Each of you was created with a particular passion for mission. We're going to talk about how to discover that. We're going to talk about how to continue to build on the, the life that God has given to us and what it looks like to be people who live a life of grace. But for now, I'd like to pray with you and for you that God would continue to help you discover who he created you to be and you use your personality to change the world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that this is a place filled with personality. God-given personality. You breathe this into us when you knit us together in our mother's womb, when you formed us out of the dust of the earth. And I pray that as we leave here today, we would have a stronger sense of the sacredness of our personalities. That these are gifts that you've given to us. And yeah, they've got some weaknesses. We need to be aware of them. But the strengths and how you can use us to shape our families and shape our, the places where we work, our neighborhoods, our church, our world. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would discover today the joy and the awesomeness of our personalities. And may your grace shape us to be people who bring grace to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.